what we want to ask today is like, um, well, why did it succeed and what are the pluses and minuses of the institutional and regulatory characteristics that have produced that system? And so we have a great panel to talk about this. Um, Aditya, I want to start with you because uh, you're with the IMF and you were, you've twice now come to do financial sector assessments of Canada. Uh, tell us what you found. What are the key ingredients that produced the stability of the financial system? Uh, how likely is that to be sustained? And are there drawbacks to the institutional characteristics that have produced that stability? Sure. Thank you, Greg. Uh, <clears throat> I'm one of the few foreigners who, who come occasionally to the Canadian financial system to try and find out what makes it tick. Uh, we, the IMF conducts a uh, financial sector assessment uh, of the systemically important fun jurisdictions once every five years. We were here last year, and uh, it, was, it's, it, it's all, it was a delight to be here, particularly because it is the one bright spot in what was essentially a fairly bleak global landscape in the financial system. Did you so, come in December or January? Uh, we were here in <laughs> June and September. <laughs> we picked our dates. No, no wonder <laughs> you were <laughs> thrilled. <laughs> and we, 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 uh, we engaged in conversations with uh, uh, policymakers at all, all levels, especially, and with the industry, and with other stakeholders. Uh, uh, we published our report. It's available on the web. If you can't understand me for some reason, I speak too fast occasionally, you can refer to, uh, to, to the report to get the background on what I'm, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So the financial sector assessment program that we conducted, essentially we started with our doing our own analysis, uh, including with the top-down and bottom-up stress tests, which simulated uh, 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 the worst recession Canada has had in the last 35 years, uh, looked at fairly severe downturns and concluded that despite the shocks, the Canadian banking system had, uh, was resilient to, uh, to, to in both credit market contagion and liquidity risks to the kind of shocks that we had administered. And the Canadian banking system has been profitable for the last five, six years continuously. It's been, uh, it's well provisioned, it's uh, impairment, it's loan losses are low. In, essentially, and its capital levels have been high. So in all in well, all the various indicators that we look at, the Canadian banking system has stood out fairly strong globally. We then followed up by doing uh, an assessment of the compliance of uh, the Canadian supervisory and policy frameworks against international standards on both banking supervision, insurance supervision, and securities regulation. And there, too, a conclusion was that, to a large extent, uh, the Canadian system met with the standards uh, and demonstrated a fairly high level of compliance with them. The Canadian banking supervisors, particularly at the federal level, were very effective. They ran a tight ship, a very prudent, very sound, prudentially regulated system, which was, and, and I'll talk about why it sort of works well, but essentially the outcome was that it led to a very clear articulation of their expectations and the fact that the industry responded well to it, particularly because uh, the, it provided them with a strong reputational um, sort of advantage of being part of a well-regulated system, probably led to some funding advantages, though we couldn't quantify that uh, very clearly. We then looked at the crisis management and safety nets framework, and we found at the federal level that it, again, a very good arrangements, which were based on very, uh, very effective arrangements for sharing information amongst the various agencies, which we don't find usually in other countries, including sharing of confidential information amongst the, uh, say, the, the various stakeholders involved, which leads to, which facilitates good policy formulation. So essentially, again, a very positive uh, sound we found there. Of course, we are trained to be skeptics and to look for what is not right. And so we did try very hard, and we concluded that there were few issues which Canada needed to, and the banking system in particular, needed to be wary of. The key risk in Canada, and you all know it, is the housing sector. Household indebtedness is high. Housing, uh, the housing sector, there's been, and uh, um, there are elevated price levels in some parts of Canada. The much of the risk, the first order of impact on the Canadian financial system is uh, muted by the large extent of the provision of federal uh, mortgage insurance. But all the same, it remains uh, a, a, an issue which the, the, the system needs to think about, particularly uh, going ahead if Canada decides to pass on more of the risk retention to the private sector and move away from a fully 100% mortgage insurance system, then the banks will have to adjust to the risks as they, as they play themselves out. The second issue which we thought was important to signal was uh, the, the, the fact that uh, if everybody's patting you on the back, you tend to become complacent a bit. And there, there was this issue of whether or not Canada would keep up with the game with, in the sense that all their other peers uh, in the US, the UK, Europe, and Asia who, having taken a beating from the crisis, were doing really well in trying to implement their new risk aggregation risk management systems uh, 
uh, and uh, implementing the reform agenda pretty well. So the idea is to what extent Canada can keep up with all of these, although it's already way ahead, but how does it keep up? So that was the second issue which we sort of flagged uh, that it's necessary to not rest on the laurels but keep moving. The third, uh, the, 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 the third issue which we, which we again mentioned is, uh, is to do with the overseas operations of the Canadian banks. Uh, this is a fast, uh, it's an area in which banks have been growing rapidly in the U.S., in the Caribbean, and Latin America. And uh, about a quarter of their income of Canadian banks now comes from the overseas operations. But a higher proportion of their losses also come from their overseas operations. To some extent, this is understandable. Uh, you are being able to diversify from Canada risk successfully. You're paying the price for it, also by new acquisitions, moving into new territories. But clearly, looking ahead, it's an area which you want to monitor and uh, keep an eye on closely. And the last issue which we flagged was the fact that uh, there were some institutions at the provincial level which were also becoming systemically important, deposit-taking institutions. And it was important that uh, the Canadian financial system, which is the sum total of all the financial institutions in the country, is able to sit together and uh, share the knowledge and resources required to supervise these institutions across these various jurisdictions. Having said that, so we, when we looked at, so what is it that makes the financial system strong uh, and, and made it perform the manner in which it has, we concluded that there were several factors. Lots has been written about it. So we leave out the history part of it, which, uh, where people talk about why the Canadian banking system evolved into six large banks, which is very different from what the original US system was, for instance. One of the reasons, of course, was a very strong federal fiscal stance at the time when the, uh, the world entered a crisis, which enabled much of the measures which the government took to be appear credible and therefore effective, and therefore they worked. The second is the very strong prudential regulation framework. Uh, nobody really, I mean, uh, uh, Canada is one of the leaders in the adoption of international standards. It's the first country in the world to have adopted Basel III on an all-in basis. Uh, it's the first country in the world to have set up uh, systemically sort of surcharges for their domestically, systemically important institutions. And this lead, the lead which it takes in adopting these standards has a positive effect on the reputation of the system and we believe therefore also in the credibility of the system largely. So that's another reason why this has worked very well. The third is it's a small system. Yeah. It's informal. It's easy to get this. If you get the six big banks in a room, you have 93% of the system in the room. And therefore, it's very easy. Uh, this, this kind of the, the ease and ability of communication to a small system enables a lot of the articulation of, uh, uh, and formulation of policy to take place in a, in, in a very uh, sort of uh, in an environment which makes it easy and acceptable in a certain sense. So let me leave it at that, and then we can maybe sure. follow up on some of these. So David, I want to pick up on the last point he made. Six banks, 93% of assets, easy to get them in a room. A lot of banks aren't in that room, the smaller banks. So. Um, Talk to us about how, as running the, um, the Canadian operation for one of the largest globally diversified financial systems, what are the opportunities and challenges of doing business in Canada, especially for Canadian corporates that want to go abroad? Uh, what can you, what, what is the value that you can provide and, uh, in, in a system that is so dominated by the six Canadian banks? Sure. Uh, well, thank you, Craig. Um, uh, and I think the way you frame that is right. So we are, we, J.P. Morgan Chase, are a, are a large global bank. Uh, we operate in uh, something like 60 countries around the world uh, with 240,000 people. So it's a, it's a big global operation. Um, here in Canada, we have over 1,300 people, and we actually do have a sort of subset of a lot of the businesses that we would operate globally. Um, and what we find is we have, A, tremendous respect for the Canadian banks. To your point, they, have, they run excellent operations. They have real scale in this market. Um, so we try to find areas where we can provide unique services to clients uh, that leverage our uh, strengths around the world. So domestically, there are a couple of things that we do well um, that could be defined as domestic businesses. One is in the payment business. So Chase Payment Tech. Um, so whether you're Starbucks or Tim Hortons, that's OK, because you'll see our terminals at, um, uh, at, at both. Um, but that's the payments business, and that's over 20% market share um, you know, here. So we think of that as a domestic business that fits into a global payments uh, business. But Canada's a big part of that. Um, but most of what we do is looking at the Canadian investors or you know, large Canadian companies and helping those companies outside of Canada. So what we find is that um, this normal growth of a Canadian company uh, 
generally involves some border, some border crossing in the U.S., which the gentleman at the beginning on his first chart talked about, this huge market in the U.S., and we have a big operation in the U.S., so that's a natural place for us to engage with a, with a client like that. Um, and we find the investment community in Canada, and one of our panelists earlier today representing some of the pensions, you know, these, these uh, pensions are investing all over the world. So we find that we can actually provide real value uh, within our own network, uh, which is local in many of these places. So we have a head office relationship, so to speak, and then we also have global connectivity. And that's where we really find uh, we can pick our spots to, to compete here. But there is um, the underlying core, um, uh, which, we, which we just talked about, is there is a, a real strength in the Canadian domestic business. So you have to be selective, even as a global bank, in terms of where you can add real value for clients. Um, Koji, let me ask you about what it's like um, in terms of inbound banking right. services, because you, uh, uh, your bank services very large right. global companies, many of them are Japan-based, and a lot of them want to do business in Canada. Um, talk to me, for example, project finance. How have you been able to tap that right. as um, a specialty? And, and also, let's bring this conversation forward, because we've seen what's happened with the oil price, and obviously a lot of project finance right. was aimed at right. the Western oil patch. What do you see happening to right. those business opportunities yeah. okay. as a consequence of what's happening to the okay. price of oil? Thanks for the question. Um, well, us uh, being a, a Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ, we call also MUFG today. Um, uh, not many people know uh, about our presence in Canada for over 60 years already. And uh, we have, throughout those years, we have been perpetu uh, perpetuating our relationship banking concept uh, throughout the world. So therefore, we have um, um, created a lot of our presence outside Canada, uh, outside Japan, including Canada or other parts of the world, including Asia, where we have, we have a bit, uh, very big presence. So we're seeing a lot of investments coming into Canada, especially in the Western Canada, uh, where we see a lot of LNG projects. We're seeing 200 billion um, class of uh, investments coming in uh, uh, over the last, uh, next five years. And we see a lot of those are coming from outside Canada. It's, it's a non-Canadian investment coming into Canada, which is a vast opportunity for us, uh, global banks, including Davis uh, uh, Institution. Um, I think we can have a lot of uh, um, uh, roles played here. And project finance is becoming one of our uh, core uh, products to be provided in this, in this region. And uh, of course, LNG, oil patch, and oil, oil and gas business, we see this um, downturn in, in the price. We do go through a lot of stress testing um, as of today, but uh, we see that this Canada Canadian um, expansion in the Western Canada is a must for the Canadian economy. And we feel that, uh, as I said, being committed to the market uh, over, over, over 50 years, we see that uh, in a more of a longer term uh, initiative rather than a kind of short cycle story. So I think there is a lot of opportunity that uh, a lot of foreign banks can provide, especially in the, um, um, other product areas, which uh, maybe um, uh, the local Canadian banks may not be able to provide. We probably um, tie our hands together with our other, other global peers to support these initiatives going, uh, going on. But is, it like, is the downturn in the oil price likely to, A, first of all, affect the loan quality of the uh, financing that you and other banks have already right. done there? That's number one. Right. And number two, does it affect the willingness of equity investors to be involved? And does that, right. therefore, indirectly dry up the opportunity yeah. for you to well, be involved? The, uh, I think the debt providers cannot uh, act in any way without any equity investment in, in place. Because as you know, the banks are not here to uh, get the upside of the, uh, of the revenues. But uh, I think um, um, investments coming out for, aside, uh, from, from outside Canada, because we bank outside and we bank the parents, uh, we know the credit of those uh, companies com coming in. Yeah. So that's where we can provide more value to the, to the Canadian peers uh, on the credit um, propositions. And also um, structuring. I think uh, Canadian market had been supported by more of a painful vanilla loan um, products, whereas um, I think a lot of um, investors coming outside, uh, coming from outside Canada, will be looking into these structured uh, transactions, where uh, the expertise uh, on the structuring and also project financing initiative will uh, come into play. So. Um Next question for all of you is that the Canadian government has, has for some time expressed concern about the concentrated nature of the, the banking system here and, is, and part of its 
policy thrust has been to make the smaller banks more competitive. And that has uh, interacted with the framework, the regulatory framework. For example, uh, the six Canadian banks, I believe, will all be subject to a domestic systemically important bank surcharge. Uh, what do you see as the likely consequences of this differential regulatory approach? Does that create breathing room for more competition, either from foreign banks or from non-banks to come in? Where, where, what type of trends have you seen already in place to create new competition in the banking system? And where do you see that going forward and whether these regulatory changes are likely to affect it? Uh, David, can I start with you? Because I think you've uh, given sure. us some thoughts. Um, so it's an excellent question, and um, there has been a number of things published out of the Department of Finance over the last few years. And um, actually, if you, if you looked at Jeremy Rudin's, uh, who's now the, the superintendent of OSFI, which is the bank regulator here in Canada, um, he did a speech a couple of weeks ago, which is published, which talks about this effort around increasing competition um, within the Canadian landscape. So I think it's, um, I think it's early days. Uh, but there certainly seems to be um, a focus from government and finance to, to find a way to create competition. Um, I think when I, you know, with, when I go back to sort of our business, um, you have to ask yourself the basic question, which is what can you provide to clients which is unique and different? And um, so I wouldn't expect that these changes are going to lead to material new investment today but they certainly could lead to more investment over time and may create a framework for some of the smaller Canadian institutions um, to grow in a different way and maybe with a little bit less um, of a regulatory focus. You know, for our business, we are um, regulated by our home country regulator as well as we'd be regulated here, uh, here in Canada. So you know, we would expect to, to, to still approach a very strong regulatory framework in order to do business here. Um, but I think the efforts are interesting and I think it's, um, uh, it's something that we'll have to see play out over time. Um, and it'd be interesting if the consumers in the room say, you know, we need competition or not, because if you have six competitors, you'd argue that there is actually some competition already. Um, so it'll be interesting to see um, how that will, will spread out over time. Aditya, was your work able to address this question about whether um, there are products or pricing that uh, Canadian clients, especially business clients, aren't getting because of the oligopolistic nature of the banking system here? Well, we, uh, we did have conversations uh, in this regard, but uh, I wouldn't say that we concluded that the competition uh, in, in the system was, uh, in, in a sense, uh, being uh, uh, held back because of the concentrated nature of the banking system. Uh, Canada is not the only country with a high concentration of banks. Uh, Australia is another one, which has a higher concentration than Canada. And then you have France and Italy. Uh, the, uh, the top five banks have uh, sort of eight. Sorry, it's not. Uh, the top. Okay, where the t top five banks have a, a, a share of the uh, assets which are more than, say, let's say, 75 to 80 percent. So it is, uh, it's, it's, it's not uh, unique uh, in, in that sense, but this is a defining feature of this system because the six banks have a very large proportion of the, of, of, of the, of the assets. So it's, it's interesting that in our conversations with the banks, for instance, they themselves refer to, to it as a competitive oligopoly and occasionally as a disciplined oligopoly in a sense because so it was there was they didn't see the effect on consumer uh, products or pricing they saw themselves as competing very strongly with each other but it was just that it uh, they despite the efforts of the government uh, over the last couple of decades there hasn't been much growth in the uh, or there haven't been many challengers who have been able to take their place in the small and the medium segment on the point of differentiated regulation as you pointed out that is now a global phenomenon because you have the global systemically important banks being subject to a different surcharge or a different uh, framework of regulation on account of size and complexity. Similarly, you have uh, at the domestic level the same thing happening. Across the border in the US, you have had, uh, you heard uh, Governor Turullo spoke up, speak about how there has to be a segmented nature of regulation, a realization, recognition that size and complexity brings about different kinds of risks or scales up the risks in such a manner that they need to be treated differently. So we do expect over, over a period of time to see regulation to become more segmented uh, in, 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 these, in, in, in uh, national jurisdictions. And have you seen actually in the past that this actually has encouraged competition? Do we have any empirical evidence that that actually can be expected? That's or are we sort of in uncharted territory here because this is the first time we've sort of done it, done it this way? No, that's an interesting question. We, uh, I think you can, you can find uh, uh, instances of both kinds, where it has worked and where it hasn't worked. Yeah. In a sense, uh, 
the, some of the other defining features, again, of the Canadian banking system, for instance, are there's a requirement for the big banks to be very widely held. This also makes it, and, and also there is, um, there is uh, in a sense, uh, a policy preference for not, uh, uh, not permitting mergers between the big institutions, for instance, that preserves the nature of the, of, of the system. So these are defining features of the system which have acted to promote stability where to the extent to which they might have thwarted competition is not really clear, uh, not from the work which we've done at least. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you can address that, but yeah. I actually want to throw yeah. another question in yeah. there that you can yeah, tackle. No, I think it's, uh, um, in terms of, um, I think the banking um, business is a pretty much um, oriented on the infrastructure. So it's an infrastructure uh, heavy business. So it does require a lot of return um, propositions before the banks can invest. Yeah. So uh, we were talking to, the, uh, we were uh, having a discussion with David um, earlier about us being a CEO uh, in, uh, as a global bank in, in this country. We are always kind of uh, advocating to our head offices for uh, investments or IT investments or infrastructure investments, which will create a, a kind of deposit taking functions or cash management, which will kind of, you know, partly to uh, so purpose of uh, you know catering the uh, liquidity requirements and so, so forth. So I think the regulators have been very good, transparent enough to, to create this uh, uh, competition in the market. But I think uh, each uh, entity needs some propositions to come into the market. So that's something that we've been doing. You know, maybe half our our, our time is spending talking to our head office, trying to bring the resources to, to, to Canada. D David, that's actually an that. interesting question. Let me ask this. Right. Sure. You know, um, what's that conversation like? Capital is a scarce commodity, especially in the American banking system. You have to go to your uh, colleagues in New York and say, and, and, and petition for more capital to grow the Canadian business. What's that conversation like? When, you, when they look at this, what goes on the, the plus side of the balance sheet and what goes on the negative side of the balance sheet when they're trying to make that decision about whether to put more investment into Canada? Um, well, certainly, being a AAA rated country with a a uh, strong regulatory system, I think, is a, is a very big plus. Um, um, but there's lots of competition, to Koji's point, for investment around the world. So if you looked at the very first chart that was up here this morning, looking at growth in different regions, right? you sort of weigh that stability versus growth. Uh, and then you try to find, with a number of client conversations, to say, where would clients like you to provide a differentiated service? And so you take all of that together, and you, know, you go back to head office and have conversations. and um, and again, that takes time because at the, at, you know, we have multiple stakeholders, holders, as you can expect, um, one of which is our shareholders and, and several others. So the decisions from a senior management perspective on where to invest, um, we look at all kinds of factors. But you know, I think it's, I think there is a, the fact that Canada has done so well over the last many years um, provides a real framework for investment in this country. And I'd say around the edges, we really are. Um, investing in different businesses here. Uh, and mainly, again, going back to that sort of core principle, which is to help both global companies operate in Canada and to help Canadian companies operate outside of Canada. So we think of it as that border crossing business. Um, and we are, um, on balance, you know, net investment. Um, I'd like to see if, uh, bring some of you into this conversation. Are there any questions out there? And if so, um, we'll get a microphone to you and um, you can uh, put your hand up. Um, uh, right over here, please. Uh, my name is John West. Thank you for the interesting discussion. Uh, my question is really for Mr. Asada. And of course, the, the Japanese economy has been slowing, uh, or not doing very well for a long time. Are you seeing increased activity in Canada by Japanese companies? Right. And in particular, is the nuclear crisis in Fukushima attracting interest in LNG and other things right. in Canada? Yes, uh, energy is a, is a big word uh, in Japan. I think uh, with the nuclear uh, uh, incidents, I think uh, uh, how we procure as a country uh, the energy is a big proposition. I think also for Canada, uh, you know, finding the where, where they export the LNG, um, you know, the, the resources to is another proposition that, that they need to think about. So there is a good match that we can support. Uh, a lot of investment coming from not only from Japan but from Asia or Europe, where we, we, we bank, they come into uh, to the Western Canada, Alberta, and British Columbia, and uh, and we are here committed to support that, and we are seeing a lot of flows, and we're already seeing a lot of behind the scenes, a lot of uh, talks with uh, our Japanese um, friends uh, coming, uh, thinking about expanding into the in, in those regions. 
and uh, financing is the key uh, to, to support those in initiatives. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Um, I'd like you to, oh, sorry, uh, right over here, please. My name's Nora Alfreider. Um, if I hearken back to Robert Greenhill's comments around um, uh, using our talent and services as a platform for global growth for Canadian companies, financial institutions seem to me a shining example of that. And I wondered, um, Amitya, our colleague from the IMF, if there were concerns that I heard you starting to raise around some of the global expansion uh, on the part of our banks or for that matter, our pensions and, uh, and insurance companies? Sure. Um, the, as I said, the global expansion of, Canadian, of the Canadian financial system is, is, essentially, uh, is, is essentially almost a must to be able to get away from, to diversify from Canada risk and the commodity risk, which has basically been the, uh, uh, the, 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 the key focus of uh, our exposure here in the, in, this, in the country. So to a certain extent, that is almost a must. But the point which we made was that uh, the it, uh, that the early that uh, our analysis suggested that the banks were uh, in their exposure overseas or in their operations overseas were uh, sort of the, the the impairments were more than they were uh, get, uh, they were getting on the same domestic business in Canada, and again to qualify that that is also not unexpected. When you are working in new territories and new jurisdictions, you will, or expanding in new territories and new business lines, you will initially have a higher uh, sort of risk profile. You, you're meeting a higher risk profile. So that's also to be expected, and there's a cost of acquisition, and therefore the, so all of this factors into the, 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 uh, the comments that I mentioned. What we, the, 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 the caution that we raised is that uh, this is an area which needs to be something which is constantly monitored and that's primarily because the operations in these jurisdictions may not be subject to the same kind of oversight as is being they are being subject to in Canada, for instance, through the federal regulator here. So therefore, it requires the banks to keep, be, be more vigilant about their overseas exposures and their overseas expansions, not to contain them in any manner. Uh, so that is not the suggestion. I want to be very clear on that. Thank you. Um, let me actually I, I, ask I, a real... Oh, sorry. I, I just yeah. comment on that just quickly. The, um, you know, it's... It's hard to run a global organization of any kind. If you, you know the, the woman uh, Meredith who's up here for Cisco, I mean, it's hard to run that business. It's hard to run any of these businesses. Um, you know, one of the things that that we find is so interesting is because we operate in so many countries. So we we hire domestically in lots of countries, and then we move people around. And uh, it struck me the other day. I was with I was with a group within one of our teams of about a dozen people. Half of them born outside of Canada. All but two of them have worked for at least two years outside of Canada. Right, so this diversity of team gives you a real interesting perspective on how you service clients and how you, you, know, you work with that. So I think for any business, um, whether it's a Canadian business expanding outside of Canada or global companies doing business here, um, you know, I think getting the nuance right around people and finding the right mix of taking your local talent and exporting them around the world and finding great talent around the world and bringing them in um, I mean, it's an art, and it's it's uh, it's something we work very hard at, and um, I think the Canadian banks do also, and and other you know big companies. Uh, but it's it's an interesting um, balance as you're trying to do that and execute on behalf of clients. Hi, if I could actually ask you and Koji, you've both worked uh, for your parent companies in other countries. How does the environment, both the cultural and the the overall environment, differ in those countries from from Canada? What do you find unique about the Canadian? business environment and how does that help or hurt uh, your businesses? Sure. You start? I need some time to think. All right, I'll start. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm Canadian. Um, uh, grew, up, grew up in London, uh, Ontario, worked in Toronto um, at one of the Canadian banks and then moved to New York um, uh, about 15 years ago, 14, 15 years ago. And so I spent about a dozen years in New York at a few different firms and, uh, and I've been back here for three. And I think what's really interesting is um, you know, there is a niceness to doing business in Canada, right? which is good and bad. Um, but the, the community being small and the community being accessible, so the comment that was made earlier that the conversation between government and business is real and, um, and it's achievable in a country like, like Canada. Um, the size and scope of the business in the United States is amazing. So multinational companies, US-based or Asia-based or 
you know, Europe or other places, but just the size and scope of some of these businesses and what they're doing around the world and the deal size, you know, multiple, you know, tens of billions of dollars of deal size is incredible. So you don't necessarily get the same scale of business here because by definition Canada is a smaller country versus someplace like the US um, and New York specifically. Um, but there is a real, um, uh, there is a real community here that exists, and, and I think that if you want to get things done, that, that relationship between business and government is, uh, is quite productive. And quite frankly, the, the community of senior leaders, there, there's a real community of senior leaders who seem to interact uh, within the business community to also get things done on behalf of you know, their, their companies and, and on behalf of the country. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you. Um, I think, um, uh, I think the Canadian banking market, is, uh, in terms of human resources, is very similar to Japan, where uh, uh, dominant banks, maybe three or four banks, are dominating the market. So a lot of uh, people will be moving around within the banking, same banking community. So a lot of people uh, with us have been staying with us for a long time. And so uh, compared to where I used to work in London and New York, there are more, more of a turnovers there. So I think there's a little mentality of staying and commit, being kind of committed to one uh, corporations. But uh, I think there is a diversity that's been uh, you know, being created these, uh, uh, um, in the recent years where we bring a lot of product people and uh, uh, resources from other countries and uh, so forth. So I think the diversity is becoming more important, I think, in the market, uh, probably in the, like, uh, as compared to the past. So, yeah. uh, do we have any other questions? Um, let me, um, uh, we were talking a little bit about, about um, the pluses and minuses of overseas expansion, and um, I'm going to ask you all to sort of like step outside your current frameworks now and sort of imagine the case for a Canadian bank going overseas. I think, David, you're pointing out to me that um, the valuations Canadian banks are now attract are quite high relative to their foreign peers. What sort of impetus is that likely to have in terms of what type of expansion are we likely to see of uh, Canadian banks abroad, and uh, what are the uh, pluses and minuses of that? Well, I think I'll speak to that question more from a look-back perspective. But um, you have seen some of the Canadian banks really take real efforts outside of Canada. Um, and, uh, and I do think there is, uh, because the system here has been so strong, there really is an advantage in some ways that Canada is um, well-received when some of the big companies here, whether it be in banking or outside, you know, really want to expand outside the country. So. So I do think there is a uh, probably continued opportunity over time, um, although I think if you just look at the, at the last five to 10 years, um, many of the larger banks have already made moves outside of Canada, um, and in some cases, quite substantial. And some of them have been doing it for decades. Yeah. So. Um, I do want to, uh, uh, just because we're talking so much about the Canadian economy, and, and um, there was something very striking about some of the charts that Joey put out in the morning presentation, especially the level of household indebtedness. And this is something that Aditya, the IMF, focused on to a great extent. Um, one thing I'm kind of curious about is whether, and this goes to the complacency question, whether um, uh, Canadian banks and, and Canada in general is perhaps um, just a little bit too complacent about how well the banking system has done, the extent to which that really is essentially an, a, a consequence of, the, of a boom in real estate values. I mean, I covered the U.S. banking crisis quite closely, and going into that crisis, Canadian, American banks were very proud about how well capitalized they were. But that strong capital position turned out to be somewhat ephemeral um, because a lot of the assets weren't worth what they thought they were. Uh, and I'd be curious as to whether um, uh, how risky it is that we're going to wake up one day and discover that the Canadian banking system was similarly fragile. Um, there was a great chart of the U.S. versus the Canadian household debt uh, to income ratios. David, we were talking about that. And um, a lot of that decline in U.S. debt since then was because of write-offs and defaults. Some of it was incomes growing, some of it was paying it back. So clearly, there is the possibility, we've seen this through history over and over again, that what looks like a very strong asset picture turns out not to be very strong. So just speculate for me on, on how likely it is we are to see some kind of a bad surprise on the asset front, and um, how confident we can be that the Canadian system can do significantly better than its peers did when they were in that same situation six years ago. What, uh, I think that's yeah, for you. Why don't we start with you? Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> So um, 
the, the if you look at it, the uh, the mortgage portfolio, including uh, consumer loans, which are backed by mortgages, are uh, probably about 30 to 35 percent of the bank's uh, asset on the bank's asset side. So it's a pretty strong uh, proportion of the bank's uh, uh, portfolio. Now, the question is, as, as we pointed out, we do see housing, uh, the housing sector as a key risk to the financial system. So we, we, we recognize that uh, a large scale, uh, a large stress event, which may result in a large scale uh, 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 deterioration in house prices could have together with the effect on, uh, you know, how, uh, on household indebted indebtedness may clearly have an impact on the bank's, uh, bank's positions. And which is why in our uh, stress test, which I suggested, we ran a simulation which, uh, which looked at a 35% fall in house prices over a three-year period and tried to simulate what the impact might be in terms of were the banks well capitalized. I agree with you that capital can be illusory at times at, in, in stress moments. But the good part, but one strong point about the Canadian banks is that the capital they were holding or the capital which they have, they, the, the federal regulators haven't allowed them to hold a lot of dodgy instruments as capital, which, which were prevalent in some of the other jurisdictions at, at that point of time. So on the one hand, so if I were to just sort of sum it up, I'd say the risk is real. It remains to be the, the key risk in the financial system. A large-scale de de-escalation in housing prices or otherwise affecting household indebtedness could have an impact on the bank's balance sheets. To a large extent, the first round effects are mitigated because, as I mentioned, about 60% of all outstanding mortgages are, in a sense, covered by the, the, the federal insurance uh, uh, system. So in the first instance, they wouldn't really have the impact. In the second round effects, would, would, uh, uh, they would have an impact on the bank. Uh, it's as somebody as, as it's been described. The the federal insurance system essentially takes on the the risk of the mortgage portfolio here, and then collectivizes it by passing it on to the taxpayer in a certain sense. And the moment uh, this changes, this 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 the, this could, this could be a, 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 an even greater issue for banks to be cognizant about. We believe it should happen, but it should happen slowly over a long over a period in, enough of a period to allow the adjustments to be made. So. Yes, it's a real risk. Uh, uh, it's at this point of time, our, 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 uh, our assumption is that it's well managed, that the banks have the position, the capital positions to maintain this, uh, 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 any major deterioration in these prices. But it's something that they should be constantly being watch, uh, watching out for because purely history. I think the last 50 crises we've looked at, two thirds of them have been preceded by housing booms. And clearly, the vulnerability in housing is something which is, and, and valuation in housing is also not something which is very easy to determine to what extent our houses valued. So I'll leave it at that. So I'll just make um, just a couple of comments to, to add to that. Um, and I'm certainly not going to speculate on, on housing. Um, but there's more capital in the system, right? The banks have more capital. And that's a broad statement, but I think it's generally true that the, the banks have more capital today than they did a few years ago. So part of the regulatory environment has been hold more capital. That seems to be something that would obviously promote a, um, a more stable system. Uh, so that's one. Two, I think that because the Canadian economy has done well relative to other global markets, there is, there is an influx, right? The immigration trend that continues to happen here and the migration trends within the country. So whether it be to the city of Toronto, whether it be to, you know, to Vancouver and parts of BC or to to the energy markets, right? There's a, there's a migration that's happening also, and so um, if employment remains, uh, you know, in a in a strong way, and the economy can have an underlying strong fundamentals um, with more capital in the system, you'd think that those could be mitigants to potential risk over time.